No matter where you go in the multiverse of Magic the Gathering, it seems that total annihilation is just around the corner. In one place, Nikki B is raining down hailfire, while in another, the Eldrazi are upsetting the laws of physics. But as an avid media consumer, I never believe that the apocalypse is actually going to happen, because if it did, then the creative team at Wizards of the Coast would be forced to come up with new material, rather than just revisit the same places over and over. In a story, ironically, when the stakes aren't world-ending, then you get to care more about each character. Every life starts to matter. The Tempest block and its narrative sequel, The Mercadian Masks block, tell an adventure story centered around a core cast of characters who travel to a foreign world to rescue their kidnapped captain. That captain is Cisse, and she's in charge of a magical flying ship called the Weatherlight. Over the years, she's been going on a treasure cruise, flying all over Dominaria to procure powerful artifacts, which come as part of a set called The Legacy. No one seems to know what The Legacy is or why it's important, and just that it is important. One of her crewmates, a man named Stark, clues her into a piece of loot that might interest her, but as they're retrieving the booty. An alien named Volrath kidnaps her and takes her back to his homeworld. When Stark gets back to the ship, short one captain, he tells everyone what happened and adds a few details of his own. I was able to peek through the portal before it closed, he says, and it looks like our abductor took Cisse to the world of Wrath. Not Wrath, says the crew, all upset. What do we do? I'll tell you what we do, says Jerry Kappa, the hero of our story. We go to Wrath immediately to rescue our beloved captain, and in the meantime, I shall fill in for the role of beloved captain. Jerry has a high charisma score, so they all let him become their temporary leader. Excellent, says Stark off to one side. It's all going to plan. Being a magical ship and all, the Weatherlight is capable of teleporting or plane shifting from one world to another. But no one knows how to make that happen, and it doesn't come with a user manual. And the one person who might be able to help them fly the ship is the person they need to go rescue. So Hannah, the ship's navigator, proposes that they ask her father for help. Baron is a powerful wizard who runs the Tolarian Academy for witchcraft and wizardry. But Baron doesn't want to help his daughter because Hannah is a disappointment to the family. Rather than follow in the family's wizardly tradition, Hannah chose to study artifacts instead at the University of Argive or, or something. Argive being a nation that has a long history of producing artificiers. While Baron doesn't help them himself, he does lend the crew of the Weatherlight the use of his apprentice, a hotshot prodigy named Ertai. Ertai? Erdi? Erdi? While he's on board, Erdi casts an advanced magic spell that allows him to pinpoint the exact button that he needs to press to make them all teleport to the world of wrath. And it works. You're all welcome, says Erdi as he leads the round of applause for himself. The blue oceans and verdant fields of Dominaria fade away, to be replaced by an endless expanse of weird rocky terrain, and some trees and a mountain. I have no idea where to go next, says Jerry, monologuing out loud. But as the leader, I cannot show doubt. That way, says Stark, pointing to the big mountain. That's Volrath's stronghold, a hollow mountain fortress from which Volrath rules the entire planet. I'm pretty sure Sisse's being held captive in there somewhere. How do you know that, says Miri, a cat person. In fact, you were the last person seen with Sisse when she was taken. What's up with that, anyway? Uh, says Stark. While Stark is struggling to come up with an answer, a giant ship attacks them, and there's a battle. And a bunch of goblins from the Predator storm onto the Weatherlight, and they go into the hold and take all of the valuable loot that Sisse has been collecting over the years, including a golem made of silver. Though Karn is an intelligent being capable of thinking, feeling, and acting, he usually chooses not to. You know, says Miri, we probably should have stashed all of this stuff somewhere safe before coming here. And she watches as the goblins carry away all of their loot. The other furry in the Weatherlight's crew is a minotaur named Tongarth, and he says, I shall not let my friend Karn be taken captive, and he leaps heroically onto the enemy ship and is promptly captured and thrown into the same holding cell as his buddy, Karn. Back outside, a woman with feathery wings is making bird noises off to the side. A nobleman named Krovax recognizes the bird person and lets out a wail of despair, and he collapses into a fetal position. Meanwhile, the ostensible hero of our story, Jerry Kappa, is dueling with a cyborg man with mechanical spine named Grevin Ilvek, who is also the captain of the Predator. During the fight, Jerry gets very upset that his main character energy is not allowing him to win the duel. But I'm supposed to be the protagonist.
bruised, he yells as Grevin chucks him over the side, and Jerry falls a long way into the forest below. Having stolen all of Weatherlight's valuables, the predator leaves and goes back and melts away into the clouds again. And during the burglary, the goblins were rather inconsiderate <laughs> as they sort of broke a bunch of stuff inside the Weatherlight, including a device that lets them plane shift. So our heroes are stuck here in Wrath. They can't go back to Dominaria. And they crash land on the forest below to heal their wounded and take a breather and get some repairs done. The ship's healer, Orem, has her hands full with the wounded, and she notices that Krovax is still curled up in the fetal position. Are you hurt? She asks him. Physically, no, cries the nobleman, but emotionally, Yes. He explains that the bird woman he saw during the battle is actually the guardian angel Selenia. For many generations, Selenia has been bound to a magical family heirloom which obligates her to watch over and protect Krovax's noble family. Over the years, Krovax began developing feelings for her, which she either did not or could not reciprocate. So he broke the heirloom, hoping that by setting her free, she would be free to love him as much as he loves her. But once the artifact is broken, Selenia is like, thanks, I'm out of here. And she hasn't been seen until now. By all appearances, she looks to be working for Volrath. And Krovax feels all betrayed and stuff. She was supposed to be mine, he says. And Orem says, uh, I have to uh, go see my other patients. Outside the ship, Miri the cat person and Hannah the navigator go wandering off into the woods in search of Jerry Kappa, or his body. The three of them have a love triangle thing going. Jerry has been into Hannah, but Hannah isn't sure because it's a workplace relationship. But Miri is into Jerry, but he's put her in the friend zone because he doesn't like hairy women. Which in this particular context, I, I don't quite understand. As they're walking, Hannah says, I don't want to get my hopes up. Jerry did fall a long way. I'm sure he's fine, Miri replies. The impact was probably absorbed by his plot armor. The two women don't bother keeping their voices down, so a bunch of elves ambush them and take them to their village. And guess who also made it to the village in the meantime? Jerry, alive and well. Not only did he survive the fall, but according to the local oracle with the elves, Jerry is a prophesized chosen one who will unite all the tribes of Wrath to rise up against the evil ruler. Never heard this story before. When Jerry learns of this prophecy, he nods wisely and says, Yes, it all makes sense. Every morning I sniff myself and all I smell is destiny. Since everyone is friendly now, the elves meet up with the Weatherlight's crew and figure out what to do next. Hannah tells everyone that the ship is damaged and can no longer plane shift. But the Lord of the Elves, Eladamri, has a solution. There's an alternate way off world, he says, a giant portal in a canyon nearby. It's currently inactive, so you're gonna need someone with immense magical talent to turn it back on. Did someone say immense, says Ertai, showing up? Wait a minute, does the portal go back to Dominaria, asks Hannah. Well, uh, good enough for me, says Jerry, and he sends Ertai to go fix the portal while everyone else comes up with a plan on how to take the fight to Volrath. Jerry says his priority is still to rescue Captain Cisse, but Stark, the sneaky weasel, decides then to add a critical piece of information. While we're rescuing Cisse, he says, maybe we can also rescue my daughter, Takara, who also happens to be a prisoner of Volrath. Why didn't you mention this earlier, says Miri, smelling him for signs of deception. No time for questions, says Jerry heroically, it's time for action. We'll get your daughter, Starkey boy. Elf guy, tell all the tribes that their savior is here, namely me. Then gather all the volunteers and lay siege to Volrath's stronghold. While your army is distracting them, Stark will guide the weatherlight around the back way and we'll sneak inside and rescue all the prisoners. Since Jerry is the chosen one, no one questions him. Stark seems to know his way around, so he's pointing out which way they need to go to avoid detection from Volrath. And the reason that Stark knows his way around is that he's from Wrath originally and he used to work for Volrath. But his old master had never trusted him, so Volrath had imprisoned Takara as a means of ensuring Stark's loyalty. So, to free his daughter, Stark hatched up a plan. He knew that Volrath had been keeping a magical eye on Captain Cisse, as she'd been flying all over Dominaria, collecting powerful artifacts. Volrath had a long personal history with the Legacy and wanted all that epic loot for himself. Again, no one seems to know what these artifacts do or why they're important, but everyone wants them, which drives up their value. Like crypto. 
Stark continues to explain, saying that he will go undercover in Dominaria and infiltrate the Weatherlight's crew and somehow win enough trust with Cissé so that he can bait her over to a specific location, allowing Volrath to kidnap her and thus incentivize the Weatherlight to go to Wrath on a rescue mission, landing right into Volrath's clutches. After Stark explains his plan, Volrath says that sounds like a simple and straightforward plan and I'm sure it will play out exactly as you describe, Starky boy. Go for it. But one more thing, says Stark. In return for leading the Weatherlight here to Wrath, all I ask is that you set my daughter free. Sure, you got it, buddy, says Volrath. Off you go. So when Stark is telling Jerry that he needs to rescue his daughter, he's not lying. The way that Stark sees it, if Jerry and the gang come out on top, then he gets to rescue his daughter. But if Volrath comes out on top, then hopefully the Lord of Wrath will hold up his end of the bargain and release his daughter anyway. So in the mind of Stark, he's doubling his chances of rescuing Takara. He's, he's not very bright. I don't think he's that bright. So the Weatherlight navigates the grimy back route through the Cinder Marsh, and at the base of the stronghold they find a steamy exhaust vent, which is wide enough to serve as a covert insertion point for the Weatherlight into the dark tunnels beneath Volrath's magic mountain. Will the Dominarians manage to rescue Cissé and Takara? Will Jerry ever learn of Stark's double dealings? Do Eladermi's allies have a chance against Volrath's forces? Who is Volrath anyway, and will he ever show up in this story? Can Airtie fix that weird portal? Tune in next time to find out. Mm -hmm.